All right. Welcome, everybody. Recording in progress. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Thursday seminar, Moss Landing Marine Labs. I'm really excited to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Sarah Graven from Oregon State uh, University. So before I introduce her, just a few reminders. Remember to keep your uh, computers, keep yourself muted during the talk and you keep your video off. Uh, but when the talk is over, you'll have a chance to ask questions live to our speaker. And at that point, use the raise your hand feature. And when you raise your hand, we'll call on you and you can unmute, unmute yourself. And you can also turn off your video if you'd like to, to say hello to the speaker and, and ask questions and we'll keep things going. So a little bit about Sarah's background, right? So Sarah did her uh, bachelor's degree at UC Santa Barbara. I was trying to remember, did I, was I a TA for any of your classes or not? I don't think so. I don't think I had that pleasure. Yeah. Concurrent, like you were a TA in other sections, but I didn't yeah, really have yeah, that. Yeah, that was right. So we overlapped a little bit there. Um, and then Sarah did her master's degree at Cal Poly where she worked with Nikki Adams and she was studying purple sea urchins. And then after that, she, she just keeps moving. It's like slowly more North up the coast. Uh, so then she went to UC Davis and was at the Bodega Marine Lab and worked with Stephen Morgan. And she was studying predator prey interactions, prey behavior, intertidal zonation, and the structure of rocky tide pools. And did a lot of work, I remember, with the six armed sea star, Lepsistarius, was kind of one of her cool study species. Uh, then after that, she moved up to Oregon. Uh, she did a postdoc with Bruce Mengi, uh, and continuing sort of working in, in the intertidal. And then currently, currently now you're a research scientist, right, at, at OSU. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, she's done a lot of really interesting work studying the consequences of sea star wasting, uh, disease, uh, trait mediated indirect effects in intertidal communities. And she does a lot of work working at the intersection of community and behavioral ecology, right? And then in addition to working in the Rocky Intertidal, Sarah has also moved you know, a bit more recently into kelp forest systems, right? And in both systems, she's interested in how species interactions and in communities are affected by climate change, uh, environmental variation and marine diseases, right? And then the consequences of those uh, for key predator-prey interactions, right, and all players there in the ecosystem. All right, so Sarah is a leading member of the Pycnopodia Recovery Working Group. She was the lead author on the listing of the sunflower sea star, which she's going to tell us about today, as an endangered species through the IUCN Red List uh, after it severely declined from sea star wasting disease. All right, she's actively working to understand and restore sunflower stars, right, and try to understand their consequences, kind of their, kind of their role in the ecosystem for kelp forests, and what's that meant, you know, in terms of the kind of the rapid explosion of sea urchins and urchin barrens that we've seen on the coast, right, and a lot of her current work seeks to understand basic demographic information and whether sunflower stars really, you know, if you can get them back, right, can they do what we want them to do and make these kelp forests healthy, so I think we'll hear about some of that today, right, Sarah's also a science advisor with the Oregon Kelp Alliance, which is working to actively restore Oregon's once lush kelp forests, uh, collaborating with a whole diverse group of academics and you know commercial divers and uh, people in lo lots of different industries. And they're testing and implementing several tools to reduce sea urchins and support kelp recovery. So with that, Sarah, you're off and you're gonna be telling us about uh, Pink Napoli. I forget the title of your talk, I didn't write that down, but I'm sure you'll, you'll throw it up when, you're, when your talk begins. I will. Um, will you enable screen sharing? Oh my gosh, we didn't do that. <laughs> and while Scott's doing that, everyone- I can't, I can't do it, but someone else can. Okay. Uh, thank you, Scott, for inviting me. I've known Scott for a while now. It's always fun to hang out and see each other. Um, while they're working on that, can everyone turn their video on for just a minute? You don't have to turn your sound on. Okay. Turn your video on. Turn your video on. There's real people there. They're, they're actually alive. <laughs> you have okay. a live audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, everyone who has their video on, or even if you don't, put one hand up like this, and one hand up like this, and then go like this. You have now been taught the official underwater sign for sunflower sea star while you're scuba diving. There you go. So if you're ever out there and you see one, you can go to like this to your buddy. And they should know. <laughs> I would be doing that very Spread the excitedly. Word. Yeah, huh? I would be so. I would be doing that very excitedly if I actually saw one alive down here. Yeah, I know. Well, we just <laughs> woke that up this year, so I'm trying to spread it, and I figure this is the perfect group to spread it with. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, you should be able to, sh to, to share your, your screen now. So. Okay. Great. Well, okay. I'm gonna mute myself and let you get going. Okay, can you guys all see my slideshow? Yep. 
Okay. All good. Okay. All right. So um, as Scott uh, said, I am Sarah Gravem. I'm at Oregon State University. And the title of my talk is Star Trek. Um, sea star wasting disease, sunflower sea star recovery, and potential consequences for kelp forest health. I am at Oregon State University as part of the PISCO group, um, and a lot of this work was funded by the Nature Conservancy, so I'll throw that up there too. And as many of you know, sea star wasting, um, sorry, I need to like move some things so that I can see my screen. Okay. Um, Hide floating meeting controls. There we go. Sea star wasting disease um, started in California and Washington a decade now, which is crazy to think about. Um, back in 2013, I actually waited a whole year to hit Oregon. Um, it extended from Baja to Alaska, so a huge geographic uh, range. It affected over 20 species, but the two that I study and the two that were hit mostly the hardest are Pisaster ochracius, the ochre star on the top right. And that's um, your, your original keystone predator. Um, I do study them. I'm not gonna talk about them today, um, but I will talk about the sunflower sea star, Pycnopodia helianthoides. Um, and those were hit the, the hardest by sea star wasting. Um, it was the largest marine epidemic on record, we believe. It was caused by, uh, we think, a virus. The jury's a little bit out on that, but I have it on good authority that it was a virus. Um, it's still happening. You can still find sea stars with lesions or melting arms and stuff like that, but it's not um, at epidemic levels any longer, and it doesn't seem nearly as deadly as it used to be. So um, it is popping up, but it's not as much of a problem as it once was, and hopefully it stays that way. So this is a video that um, I took when I was a graduate student, right when sister racing began at Bodega. And you can see that this one in the foreground has, had, has white patches on its body and its arms have fallen off and crawled away. Their body gets all floppy and goopy and then it, the arms disintegrate and everything, they die. And it's, it happens pretty fast, like within a couple of days. Um, and it seemed like once a sea star got sick, it was a death sentence at the time anyway. Um, so it was pretty drastic, pretty sad, um, and really was something to see. And um, as much as it was, you know, jarring, at first we were like, it's sea stars, they're gonna come back no big deal. And, and that was kind of true for some species. So the ochre stars came back pretty well. They're still kind of rare down in uh, your neck of the woods and south, but um, they've done, a, they've had a pretty decent rebound. But the sunflower sea star around 28, 18, 19, we were still meeting and no one was seeing them. Like it was like, oh, it's been like four years, guys, and no one has seen one in California. And these are, this is starting to be like pretty worrisome. And to the point where we started getting concerned. And so um, the Nature Conservancy was talking to the, the Pycnopodia group people and yada, yada, yada. And it all came to pass that um, Nature Conservancy funded me and Sarah Hamilton to do a global assessment for the IUCN Red List, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. It's like a barometer of life um, that's associated with the UN. And we followed their you know, assessment protocol and did a global analysis of all the Pycnopodia data we could find. And we ended up with 12 regions from Baja, California to the Aleutians. 67 different people contributed with um, 31 different data sets getting fed in. And it spanned about 53 years of time and 61,000 surveys, which was a ton. Um, IUCN is um, international. It's non, it, there's no legal binding with it. There's no like protections that get um, initiated with it, but the ESA listing, the Endangered Species Act listing is actually being considered right now. So all the data that we had went into that. And we're expecting an announcement of listing any time now. Um, we expect it to be threatened, not um, endangered for that one. But I actually don't have any control over that. <laughs> um, so the first thing that we did back in the IUCN listing 
was um, to gather all the outbreak information. So we not only had counts of sea stars, we had you know, frequencies of sick sea stars. And so we chunked time in each region into a couple phases. So the first um, is pre-epidemic, and then that's in yellow here. And then we defined the date that the sea star wasting was first observed in that region as emerging epidemic. So that's an orange. And then by the time 10% of the sites that were surveyed in that region were um, positive for wasting, we uh, called that epidemic level. And then by the time a pop the population crashed, which we defined as 75% of the sites, or so there was a 75% reduction in occupancy at sites, don't worry about it. Um, we were in post epidemic, so like the crash had already happened. And so if we look at these different phases with the north to south coastline, some trends pop out pretty quick. So if we look in like 2013, you see that all of the places um, see their first instance of wasting. Even in the East Gulf of Alaska, there's nothing for the uh, Aleutians, but um, everywhere it was present in 2013. And it went from present to emerging epidemic to epidemic to crash in Southern California and Central California within a matter of weeks. So this emergence duration, the orange one was really tight. The epidemic duration was really fast and the crash happened really fast down where you guys are. Um, as you go north, it happened much more slowly. Like in Oregon, it took a whole year from first instance to outbreak level. Um, and in Alaska, it took, you know, years, or more a year or more to go from you know emerging epidemic to crash, um, sometimes several years. So we're seeing that it just is like moving slowly through the population as you um, go northward, which makes me think that warm temperature has something to do with it, right? And I'll get back that to that in just a little bit. The next thing we wanted to know, which was like the main uh, question in the IUCN report, was how many died what percent of the population died. And so based on all of our um, data, a lot of it was just their present or their absence. So we ended up using just present absence data for a lot of this and um, density data uh, to augment it. But essentially we used the density data and the presence absence data and the geographic uh, coverage of the habitat to have kept back of the envelope, calculate up you know, how many were in Oregon pre-wasting and how many were in Northern California pre-wasting and then add all that up and look at the yearly variation based on the surveys of population size pre and purple and then the yearly variation post in like the lighter pink colors. And so what we see is they bounce around a lot and a lot of that has to do with survey effort. Um, but really clearly, once we hit the waste, the epidemic, which is in gray, you go from a lot to not so much, not so much to like almost nothing down in 2018 and 19. Um, and this is globally, right? So this isn't just California. Um, at least globally, uh, the declines were over 90%, which we estimated to be over 5.75 billion animals, which is crazy. Um, and that qualified them for critically endangered under the IUCN listing. So what a lot of people are scientists wise more interested in are the regional declines. And so we broke all of this up by region and calculated that same pre post um, decline magnitude. And when you look at the like outer coast of Washington down to Baja, every region is over 97% declines, which is a lot. And then um, as you get north of Cape Flattery it, into the Salish Sea and Puget Sound, it's around 90 to you know 95%. The Aleutians might have escaped. We're not really sure. There was not a lot of density data out there, so we couldn't get really great information, but um, they seem to be less, less of a decline up there. Um, so 
the other thing we want to know is where are they now? So this is a um, ArcGIS um, analysis that we did of odds of presence. So this is yellow is if you go to that site and you dive, are you going to see a Pycnopodia? Uh, yellow would be yes, you will see one. And purple is no, you will not see one. So if you look on um, along the coastline, you can see that essentially everywhere close to the coast and not offshore, you had a pretty decent chance of seeing a Pycnopodia on a dive um, back pre-outbreak. And that was true all the way down to Baja, um, where their old southern range limit used to be. And then if we do the same analysis on the data of 2021, and so it's like 15 to 2015 to 2021 or so, you can see that the purple, it just takes over all in this southern, you know, third or so of the range. And as you get north of that, you get some orange, some purple, um, but it's much um, cooler colors, right? And a lot more patchy. And their new southern range limit is around Cape Flattery in, in uh, Northern Washington. And so that was a 2,700 kilometer northern range shift, which is northward range shift, which is humongous. Um, some minorly good news is that we've had some populations pop up now in Oregon. So Yukuna um, Head and uh, Yukuna Bay off Newport has a little population now right off the jetty. And so, and we've seen a couple scattered ones down in Coos area. And so it seems like they're coming down the coastline at least just, but just this year. Like I think they have seen, you know, less than 50 total, which is good news, but not, you know, not, we're not out of the woods. Okay, so what drove the decline? So we took that kind of spatial map model that you just saw and in each one of those cells where we have the occupancy data, we also overlaid a bunch of environmental data from all sorts of NOAA websites. So we got um, the 90th percentile of temperature in each one. So the, the warmest warm days, essentially, and the depth profile in each pixel and the chlorophyll in each pixel and the salinity and the substrate categories. This is just like rocky to sandy. And what we can do is feed that into a species distribution model and ask which of these is most um, predictive of presence of Pycnopodia. And the blue is pre-wasting. So before Pycnopodia, or before wasting, depth was the biggest driver of Pycnopodia presence. You would find them in shallow water and you wouldn't find them in deep water. It was like 50 meters, 100, uh, yeah, 100 feet or so was where they started dwindling. And the other things like temperature were sort of important, but essentially like they were everywhere, regardless of whether temperature or salinity or chlorophyll changed. And after wasting in the red, we can see that the relative importance of temperature shot way up and the relative importance of depth shot down. So it's, it's a zero sum game, so it has to go down, but essentially the temperature importance increased by 450%. So now, the temperature of the water around you strongly predicts whether you're going to see a Pycnopodia, which match matches completely, right, with this map where you have, you know, they're present in the north and they're not so present in the warmer south. That's not to say that climate change had anything to do with it. We did actually model temperature anomaly in all of this and it wasn't really showing much at all. Um, I don't think that temperature or that climate change is, can be said to have triggered this or to be necessarily to blame for the reason that this happened. But what we can say is that warmer places were hit harder, warmer places were more deadly, and that climate change is probably not helping, <laughs> um, even if it's not the cause. Okay, so we've got now a like pretty good synthesis of where the state of this species is, where are they, where aren't they, how much of the decline. Um, and what became pretty clear as we were going through all of these steps was, you know, IACN wanted to know like, 
How old are they at a given size? How fast do they grow? What's their birth rate? What's their death rate? How old do they get? And I was just like, I have no idea. Nobody knows this information. We lack some of like the most basic ecology and demography information on this species. And that really hinders our ability to say, do an extinction risk model or a recovery model or anything like that. And so um, I got a little uh, funding from the CDOC Society and got together with some folks um, to figure out just some of this basic information. So how old are they at a given size and how fast do they grow are our two major questions that I'll answer today. There's more, but I don't have time. <laughs> so um, huh, this is not advancing. There we go. Okay, so um, we had a lot of sites, but the site data that I'm going to show you today is all from Saratoga Beach, which is on Whidbey Island, which is this big island right here. It's off the coast of Seattle um, in Puget Sound. Friday Harbor is way up here. And so it's, a, you know, a quick ferry ride out from, uh, from Seattle. And we, it's all sandy bottom. So it's in this big bay and it seems like the um, Picnos have recruited en masse into this big bay. Um, we're doing eelgrass bed surveys. Um, we're interested in some depth contours and things like that, but I won't have time to go into that today. But essentially we're surveying this habitat repeatedly every two months or so since March, 2020. Like the day the pandemic started is the day <laughs> that this uh, survey began. So um, Ken Collins who is a, um, a volunteer, you know, citizen scientist. And he does all of this um, pretty much on his own. I go up and help him occasionally, but he is really the, the main uh, person who's done all this work. And he goes out and he finds all these little guys in the eelgrass and measures them. And they are very cute. <laughs> so <clears throat> what we can do is graph how they've changed in size over time. So the sizes are on the X and the survey dates are on the Y or on the panels. So you start in March, 2020, go to, um, 2021, 2022, et cetera, all the way down to last August. And what we can see is a size distribution at the very beginning. So this is when Ken found them on March 19th, 2020, the day of the shutdown. And he tracked their growth and they're still there. And now they're like 30 centimeters or so. Or actually last year, they were like 30 centimeters or so. We think we had another recruitment event that came in right around here. He, um, long story, but he's pretty sure there was another recruitment event. And we've been tracking those ones as well. They're a little less abundant than the pink ones. And then in 2022, last February or two Februarys ago, we found uh, another cohort that landed. And um, now we have a third one. And so based on their sizes, especially of these guys. Um, we estimated that their settlement dates were around September each year. And this is based on um, how our size distributions correlate <clears throat> with the ones that have been um, raised in the lab by Jason Houghton at Friday Harbor. So of course it wasn't really September 1st, but we have to choose a date. And we think they're settling around September, uh, August or September each year. And then we can then calculate an estimated age to size ratio for each of these guys. So we've got our cohorts in the colors, right? The little tiny guys that came in recently and then the other ones that came in earlier are in the different colors. And we know their sizes and we're estimating their ages. And so we can then fit growth curves to each uh, to those data and figure out like which type of growth curve fits best. Um, we're still tinkering with some of that, but essentially if we look at the data, we think that they're around 10 centimeters at around two years, a little over two years, they hit 10 centimeters. And around four years old, they're about 25 centimeters, which is great news because that's about twice as fast as we thought they grew based on anecdotal stuff back in the IUCN report. So they grow pretty quick once they've, once they've landed. Okay, so I love sunflower sea stars. Maybe you love sunflower sea stars. And as much as um, we all 
care about their welfare. We also care about the welfare of the ecosystem that they're in. And lots of things have happened in that ecosystem in the last decade. So the first thing was that the Pekinopodia died back in 2013 to 15 was the outbreak. We think there was a big sea urchin recruitment in there because all of a sudden there were way more of them than there used to be. And right around 2015, 16, so just like a year or two after that, a marine heat wave came in the blob and wiped out the kelp forests. And so kelp are like tomatoes, they die and they grow back every year. So as these kelp spores and little tiny tinies started growing, they were met with just hungry hordes of urchins um, and the kelp crashed, right? And so this kelp crash happened around 2016, 15, 16, and it really hasn't recovered in any substantial way as far as I know. I mean, there've been patches here and there that have been doing okay. And there's a couple kelp forest beds in Oregon that made it through, but um, in general, especially bull kelp really got hit hard, like upwards of 90% uh, declines in bull kelp, at least in like Northern California. So, because of the timing, it became like a pretty clear research question of whether the these things were related, right? And if it's true that the sunflower sea star decline allowed the urchin increase and caused the kelp decline, even if, you know, climate change in the blob probably had something to do with it, if they are all related, is it possible then to say reintroduce these sunflower sea stars and help kelp forests recover um, by controlling purple urchins. So that was our first research question. And this is work that I performed with Aaron Galloway and Dan Okamoto and some of the TNC folks and a couple of Aaron's students. And um, we really first wanted to know, you know, whether these Pycnopodia could exert that top-down control. Um, we know that California sheephead and spiny lobster are also urchin predators, but they're Southern California and Mexico only, right? So that doesn't really line up with the spatial extent of the urchin takeover. And sea otters, which we all know eat urchins and have, can to totally have strong, strong top-down effects on urchins, are also super patchy, right? The kelp declines are happening from central California to the to southern Alaska but otters are only present in like uh, spots in central California near you guys they're absent in northern California and Oregon and then they start coming back in up in the Salish Sea and so their geographic distribution doesn't really overlay very well with the kelp declines and they haven't changed right like Sea otters have been absent from Oregon for 100 years, and we haven't seen a kelp decline. But suddenly, pycnos go, and the kelp go. So that makes it curious, you know? And um, the other thing about otters as a potential top-down um, predator is that they seem, they're, they're smart. <laughs> so they will pick up apparently uh, some empty urchins in a barren, give them a shake, crack open a few, and if they don't like what they find, they'll move on, right? They'll go find another prey to eat, or they'll go find a place where there is a kelp forest patch and find the, the uni-filled urchins. So they're, they're nice and smart, and so that means that, you know, even if we were to introduce otters, which I hope we do, um, they might not even do the thing that we hope they do for these, um, especially in the barrens. Okay, so Pycnopodia, on the other hand, like I said, had that similar timing and geography as the urchin increases and the kelp declines. And so that begs the question of, can Pycnos control urchins? And similarly, folks are worried, you know, maybe they are just like otters. Maybe they'll pick up an empty urchin and just toss it and go move somewhere else. Um, so our question, other question was, will they eat these barren, starving, empty urchins? Um, this is all work with Aaron Galloway who made up the sign. So there's him doing that sign. And um, I will get into it. So um, the first thing we did was a Y maze experiment, very basic. And we put a picno at the um, 
downstream part of the Y and then put different things up in the upstream parts of the Y. So we either put an urchin or no urchin just to find out if they can smell urchin. And then we put a starved urchin and a fed urchin to see if they can distinguish between the two. So if we look at the percent choice, we see that they can certainly choose an urchin over no urchin. Um, they can smell the difference. But if we do starved urchin versus fed urchin, they couldn't tell the difference. That wasn't a statistical difference. Um, it seems like they're like, urchin, yay, and go for it. <laughs> um, all right, so they can't seem to tell the difference before they capture them. Can they tell the difference once they capture them? So we did a predation trial where we fed them in tanks like as much as they wanted to eat for, um, I think it was like six weeks um, in different trials and compared, uh, first we wanted to just know like how many can they eat per day in general. So regardless of starved or fed treatment, we found they ate about 0.7 urchins per day, which means like they can eat an urchin every day and a half or so. And when we looked at the fed versus the starved urchins, we had thought they might eat the fed ones more because they could smell them and be tastier and they'd want them more. But actually we found that if anything, they ate the starved urchins faster than the fed urchins. And we were surprised by this until we looked at the handling time data and found that the starved urchins, um, they, you know, the handling time is they swallow it, they sit there and then they spit it out, right? And so we looked at the time between swallowing and spitting out. And we see that the, um, for the starved ones, they spit them out faster. And so we think it's just a digestion thing, right? Like the starved ones are less nutritious, there's less stuff to digest in there. And so they just eat them quicker than the fed ones. One uh, fun thing that we found, and maybe it's important, maybe it's not, is that we collected sea stars from different source habitats. They were actually really, really hard to find. It took Aaron like 25 dives to get 12 sea stars or something silly like that. So um, he recorded whether urchins, purple urchins were present or absent at the places that he found the stars in. And what he found, we found, was that they actually ate urchins faster if they originated, originated from a purple urchin habitat. So something about um, being having eaten an urchin before maybe makes you able to eat more urchins in the future. So I don't know how ecologically relevant that is, but it could be really relevant if we're, say, like raising them in the lab and we want them to go out and eat urchins in the wild, maybe we should feed them some urchins in the lab to get them some practice. Okay, so one and a half urchins every, or one urchin every day and a half. That doesn't sound that much, right? Like that's not that many urchins. Um, but if you think about how many Pycnopodia there used to be, which is over 6 billion, um, we can actually take that predation rate and the um, densities of pycnos that used to exist and input things like purple urchin recruitment light rate to a population, um, which we know from prior experiments, and model up the expected purple urchin density in the rainbow colors based on those three things. So this is work that Dan put together and the rainbow is a little hard to understand, but essentially all the parts of the graph in red are a barren, high densities of purple urchins. So over two purple urchins is like light blue. And everything in dark blue is not a barren. It's and um, could be a kelp forest, assuming kelp are around. So this line right here is like our forest to barren divide. And we can map that on to the purple urchin recruitment at a place, right? So of course, as you get more purple urchin recruits, you get more purple urchin adults. Um, and then we can map that onto the Pycnopodia density. And this is on a log scale. So that's the surface contour based on how many urchins Pycnos can eat per day. 
And then we can go and map onto that the pre-wasting densities and the post-wasting densities and see where they fall on this contour. So what we can first see is these pre-wasting densities, with their, which are these white lines in um, the blue area, all land in places where there are few urchins. So that means the, pre, the old densities of Pycnos should have been enough to keep urchin densities low. But if we look at the lines as they were as of 2021, they land right here, which is essentially mostly barren, right? You've got almost all hot colors in that, in those places. And so that means that the magnitude of the decline should have been enough to allow for like release of top-down control based on our lab experiment predation rates. Okay. So that's based on our, our like 0.1, uh, a nurture every day and a half estimate. And so we wanted to like poke at this a little bit and figure out whether that would hold up if we were to say have a lower predation rate or a higher predation rate. So we did a model sensitivity analysis and we took like the lowest predation, uh, the one standard deviation of the lowest predation rate we found anyway, long story, it was a low one and a high one, right? And the graph that I showed you just a second ago is this middle, which is like our average, our moderate predation rate. And we, so that's our first sensitivity analysis. And then our second one was um, preference for urchins. So we know they don't just eat urchins, right? We know that they eat all sorts of stuff. So we can also do a sensitivity analysis for like say moderate preference for urchins. Like if presented with um, to prey, they'll eat an urchin 75% of the time. Or we can do a complete preference for urchins where they'll always choose the urchin compared to the clam or whatever. Or we can do neutral, right? If we give them to prey, they'll eat urchins half the time. And we know they like urchins. So I think it's reasonable to assume that they're not going to avoid them, right? Compared to other prey. So don't stare at this too long because essentially what you need to look at is does the shape of this rainbow change that much? And the answer is not really. Um, we've got slight differences um, with the different levels of sensitivity, but in general, it stays pretty consistent. And what we can look at though is um, the current low densities, which are these solid white lines at the bottom, regardless of if you change the predation rate or you change the preference for urchins, they're always still toward the bottom of the graph in the hot part, right? So they're always predicting high densities of urchins at current pycno densities. And then the pre-wasting densities are all still in the blues for the most part, which means that the pre-wasting density should have controlled urchins regardless of these preferences for urchins on these predation rates. So the model is really insensitive to these changes and that makes us more confident that these results are real. All right, so this is predation, right? This is like literally Pycnos eating urchins and how eating one and a half, uh, one every day and a half should change the urchin population. But we know that Pycnos don't just eat urchins, right? They scare them. And so this is a video of um, Northern California by some of Scott's field sites. Uh, one of the urchin divers there spotted one of the only Pycnopodia anyone has seen in California in the last um, five or six years. And he caught it on video. And so what I want you to see as you follow him is um, sh shout out or, you know, pat yourself on the back when you uh, see the Pycnopodia. I'm going to start swimming around. You can see urchins, urchins everywhere. Oh, I see a big bear patch. What is that about? All huddled up on the rock. Look, there it is. So this urchin is, or this pigno is causing an urchin stamp. They're all 
running up the rock away from it. And the ones that are really close to it um, may or may not be running super fast, I don't know, but they certainly are running, like getting stuck on other versions, right? They're super packed in there. And as this video rewinds, you can see the path where the pigno has been. It's there in its wake. And there are urchins everywhere where it was. And there's a fish swimming back and forth. So watch. And essentially, what I want you to notice from this video is sure, it can only eat an urchin every day and a half. But it just, you see in this like snapshot in time that it scared probably hundreds, maybe thousands in the last, say, I don't know, 20 minutes, hour, who knows? Um, so pycnos don't just eat urchins, they scare them too. So that's what my um, next research um, priority is, is how sunflower sea stars affect urchin behavior and whether this benefits kelp and whether it's say even more important potentially than that predation rate um, effect. So this is a picture of a uh, similar stampede by Lin Lee up in Haida Gwaii. Um, so you can see reds in this one too. And all this work that I'm gonna present from here on out is in collaboration with Christy Croker at Santa Cruz and Aaron Galloway at the um, University of Oregon and all their students essentially, and my students. So the first thing we did, um, oh, and I will say, uh, you can see that we are in dry suits and it is, not California, <laughs> um, based on the calm water. And um, this is all pretty much all work that we've done up in Sitka, Alaska. Um, I actually got home from Sitka last night at like 10 o'clock. I've been there for a week and a half. Um, and so our team has been there all summer. Uh, and a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you today is fresh results from this summer's work. Uh, the reason we're working in Sitka is it is one of the few places you can actually find Pycnopodia and where there are also urchin barrens and kelp forests mixed together in the same area. So we can actually survey both types of habitats. And um, also it has great infrastructure. And Christy's been working there for a decade, I think, doing urchin surveys and Pycnop surveys and things like that. So it's got historical data we can compare to, which makes it perfect. That said, we're doing a lot of this work with red and green urchins because that's what's in Sitka. Um, we're working on permits and things to be able to repeat a lot of this down in California or, or Oregon with purples, um, but none of that has panned out quite yet. So stay tuned, but we're using the reds and the greens as a test case so that we can understand what the purples are doing. Okay, so the first thing we did was a mesocosm experiment. We set up um, pretty big fish tanks with um, little mini ecosystems. We put grazers in there. So they have turbine snails and two types of urchins and kelp. And then we piped in chemical cues um, using header tanks into each of these in different combos. So we either have no predator cues we have sea star cues, or we we're really interested in what otters are doing as well. So we tried to do otter cues, which at least in our, with our best guess, you know, a sea urchin on the bottom of the ocean doesn't really know that there's an otter 40 feet above it, unless that otter cracks open a sea urchin shell, eats it and drops um, a carcass down next to them. So we think that might be one of the more you know, salient ways that an otter or an urchin might know whether an otter is around. And so we use that as otter cues, so cracked open conspecifics. So we piped these different cues into the tanks in combination. So we had none, otters, sea stars, or both. And looked at prey behavior and at um, kelp graze. So this is what the mesocosms look like. And we can look at first the percent of prey that are grazing um, during the experiment. So we have red urchins, green urchins, and turbine snails. 
and the gray bars are no predators. So you can see that when there are no predators around, things are grazing more. And then when you add predators in the colors, at least for red urchins, both predators suppress grazing and both predators combined also suppress grazing, but not any more so than one predator, right? So they're reactive to otter cues, so conspecifics, and crush conspecifics and pycno cues similarly. And green urchins, same, same deal, they're reactive to both. And then turban snails seem to be much more reactive to pycno cues and not as reactive to otter cues because there's no suppression based on the otter cue. Okay, so we think they're great, they're grazing less. So this is just whether they're on the kelp or not on the kelp. And then we can look at the consequences for the kelp grazed in grams per hour with the same scheme. So without predators, there's um, more kelp, sorry, without predators, there's more kelp grazed. And as you add predators, uh, less kelp is grazed. And so, but what's interesting is this otter effect is pretty, is non-existent. Like the, Q, the crush con, con specifics didn't really affect the kelp, but the pycno effect and the both effect affected the kelp to a similar degree. So we're seeing pycno Q, just the smell, benefiting um, kelp. It's not super strong. I will totally admit that. And the reason I think it's not super strong is we were seeing really strong initial responses, but then they would dissipate over the like three day long experiment. And we think that had to do with prey Q saturation. Um, they'd get to the point where like they couldn't even smell the pycno anymore because it was just a constant flow of stinkiness. Um, so our next uh, set of experiments actually is in these huge flumes and we've created laminar flow and we've got all this stuff going on where we're looking at like distance to Q and we can really control like how much Q is reaching an urchin at a given distance. So stay tuned for all that. Um, I didn't, I haven't worked those up yet. Okay, so we've got some modest data that show that pycnos benefit kelp in the lab, at least at some, uh, for a little bit. So we wanted to take that and do it in the field, right? And so this is a project actually done by undergraduates at Santa Cruz during their um, winter quarter in uh, their field course at Sitka. And we took, um, or they took cages and put out kelp ropes. Oh, am I, how? It's 448. <laughs> Kelp ropes outside these cages and looked at grazing rates and um, also looked at urchin densities over time. So the cages either did or didn't have pycnos inside. And what we can see is that um, the percent of kelp grazed is higher here in the controls compared to the pycnopodia in the purple, but only in this first like meter or two away from the cage and it disappears at like two to four meters, right? So we're getting a benefit of that pycnopodia in the cage for the first you know, meter or two. And we did some math and figured out how the net sea star effect related to distance from cage so that we could see when this trend disappears. So wherever this line, the slope line crosses the dashed line is where the sea star effect disappears. And so for kelp in the yellow, it disappears around two meters. For green urchins in the green, it disappears at like 0.5 meters. And for the reds, the kelp effect or the urchin or the pycno effect disappears at about two meters. So around two meters is where the urchins have fled away and that benefits the kelp. When a pycno still. So what happens when the pycno is at large? So that's what we've been doing until like three days ago. <laughs> um, we're calling this the Star Trek field experiment. So we're releasing pycnos out in the ocean in an urchin barren and videotaping them for the first like 20 minutes, following their track, which is this pink line, and then doing quadrat surveys along the line and in uh, you know rays off of the track. So we can understand not only what happens to the urchins in the track, 
but how far do they go? How uh, many are affected? And then because we're doing this at time intervals, we'll do it before, just after, the next day, the next day, and the next day, we can get three days of return rates and understand how long that effect lasts. So I won't go too much longer and show you all the data, but um, this is what it looks like when we release the PICNO into an urchin barren. So there's an urchin, there's an urchin, there's an urchin, there's um, a little green urchin, a green urchin, and there's a lot of snails in abalone that are pretty cryptic until they start moving. So let's um, watch what happens. So you can see that they are scramming. We're moving the camera with the pick now as it moves and then laying down that track flagging tape behind it every two minutes. So this is 20 minutes uh, video boiled down into like 25 seconds. And we've had this pick now clear an area of about two or three meters. This was actually taken on Saturday. <laughs> um, so, what we can see, I think I'm gonna skip this one, is um, how that pycno affects the grazer count in that area. So these panels are greens on the top and reds on the bottom. The dashed line right here is the site level densities of greens and reds. So we're looking at like suppression relative to the site and um, or not, right? So anything below the line is like pycnos have scared something away. And anything above the line is they've come back at higher densities than they were before. And so when you do it before the experiment, they're at you know uh, higher densities actually because we place them right in the middle of an urchin cluster. And as we go from left to right in each panel, it's close to the close to the track. So it's right next to the track and four meters away from the track. So we're interested in whether there's a slope on that line and a slope indicates like a weakening effect with distance. So before the experiment, there were a lot of pycnos right next to the cage or a lot of urchins right next to the cage and not so many farther away because we were focused on urchin clusters for both. By one hour after we released the pycno, the, it totally inverted, right? And that's what you saw in the video. It's they're scramming away. But what's interesting is that same shape exists for at least 24 hours and maybe even longer, depending on um, the how much data we have. So this is the 72 hour mark. We literally stopped one on uh, Tuesday. So not all the data are in. But I think I can confidently say like for 24 hours, they stay away. And I'm thinking it's more like 72 based on the days on um, the data I took two days ago. Okay, so I'm going to just wrap up. What do we know? We know that pycnos eat purple urchins quickly enough to cause top-down control, at least in models. Um, that pycno declines were large enough to actually release that top-down control. Um, in most cases, so pycno, so we, wasting disease at least theoretically should have allowed urchin release. That pycno cues, even when they're stuck in a cage, suppress or, or just smell, suppress grazing in the lab and in the field at least two meters away or around two meters away. And that red urchins seem to be the main driver of that trend. Greens don't eat as much. And the active pycnos, on the other hand, cause the urchin density reductions up to around four meters away. And that lasts at least 24 hours and maybe more based on um, data that I haven't crunched yet. All right, next up, we've got a mesocosm experiment plan. It's gonna be real. We have these giant underwater pens and we figured out that we can keep pycnos and urchins inside these pens with pigeon spikes, <laughs> which is really fun. And we're really interested in this. We're gonna build like mini kelp forests next year in um, Sitka, assuming we can get money for it. Um, we're hoping all of this contributes to the recovery of the sunflower sea star. Lots of people want this to happen, but we need to make sure that it's worthwhile. 
um, for kelp forests before we sink millions of dollars into it. And so that's why I want to know the answers to all these questions. And I will take your questions now. Thanks. Very nice. That was awesome. Thanks. Love those guys. They're so cool. They're so cool. <laughs> The, uh, that last experiment, the Star Trek one, where you were dropping the, the little washers with flagging tape reminds me exactly of an undergraduate project I did. Uh, yeah. We were in Panama and we were following little schools of parrotfish that were like grazing on the reef through yeah. these fields of these like territorial damselfish. And so we would follow the school and drop the same little, little markers like that and then see like how did the damselfish density cause them to turn and change their grazing behavior. Amazing. So, so awesome. cool. I love yeah. ecology because you can do silly things like that like use things that are in industry for all sorts of weird stuff like pigeon spikes yeah yeah so useful so yeah so let's see a lot of people raise their hands and as as people decide to ask questions one thing i'll ask is it got me thinking about the changes in behavior that the pycnopodia do for the for the urchins mm -hmm. right that seems pretty obvious there's a major effect there and it's just thinking like back when pycnopodia were actually at you know reasonably common right mm -hmm. those urchins were probably getting hit you know, from so many different angles, right? Which, right. you know, I mean, you think that explains why often, you know, they would stay hunkered down in cracks and crevices because at that point we're going to be, hit, you know, almost going to be hit constantly by a pink napodia. Where else are you going to go? Right. You know, to get I, away from this is what I'm envisioning. Like, I don't, if you think about like that, if you start layering on like the time frames of like a pink napodia, what's first one pink napodia cruising a reef, right? Like thinking about how many they're scaring and based on this new data, like how long that lasts for, right? If say it's three days, right? It's cleared a four meter radius. So eight meter diameter circle that moves at a meter every couple minutes and it scared everybody out and that maybe lasts three days. So there's like a big smudge through your reef. Yeah. And then you multiply that up by like, I don't know, 50 picnos on a small reef. That's a lot of smudges. That's, yeah, that's probably much the, that's probably the entire reef, right? You that's, know? that's the landscape of yeah. fear, right? And so you're as an urchin, maybe constantly being scared and your entire lifestyle changes. Better get Dan to model it. That's his next model. That's yeah, I know. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah. All right, questions. Anyone in the room here have questions? Anyone online have questions? You can raise your hand. Or if you're in the room, you can come up and ask a question directly. Yeah. Okay, we, have, we got someone coming up in the room. Kirsten. Hi, thank you for the talk. That was super interesting. Um, I was curious for the next study that you're using the pigeon spikes for and trying to keep those animals in, what are you trying to look at versus um, just, I think, it, you know, the landscape of fear and, and how they clear out of, the, um, of your quadrat? Yeah, it, that, this is a kelp mesocosm. So the intention is to make these giant underwater arenas that are big enough that the uh, urchins aren't actually escaping, but they're changing that behavior, we think. And we're gonna use Scott's group's spore bag lasagna mo uh, method and mm -hmm. seed them with kelp spores and see if the kelp will grow. Cause the intention is to leave them out for like a year and a half. Cool. And do that have some of those mesocosms with ping Napodi and some without? And right. do that half same thing. Half with pycnos, half without. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we've been considering to doing enough nets to seed some and not seed some. And that way you'd have not only like a kelp enhancement treatment, crossed with a pycnopodia treatment and see which of those things are more important. Yeah, potentially if there's enough spores around in the background anyways, maybe you don't, you know, maybe you don't need any more, you just need to suppress the grazing enough, right, for right. stuff to be able to take off. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the spore bag enhancement is just so a positive control. So right now, that's how we're thinking of it, just so that we know that there's spores going in because they're, yeah. the, the, it's barren where we are on this experiment. So like there are kelp forests around, but they're like, a mile away. Yeah. Next question. Who else has a question? Anyone? Anyone in the group or on online there? All 
Amanda's coming up. Amanda Khan's coming up to ask a question. Okay. Is the camera on? Should I go yeah, the on. Okay. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Thank you so much. That was all of that was so interesting. Um, I have a question that's more of almost like an alternate hypothesis that I'm wondering how to address. I don't know how right, but like the the idea of urchins changing their baby behaviors is 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 predator landscape of fear, but is it also a hunger thing where if there isn't enough drift kelp as a food supply, then it's hunger based? That's that's right. sort of the cue. So it, has anyone teased that a part of asking what it is that's sort of the trigger or what the contribution is to their behaviors between those two? Yeah. yeah. So when they're hungry, they're so much more brave. Um, they will go for, they'll risk it for the biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> is what I like to call. Same, so relatable. <laughs> yeah, so um, Ross Whippo, who is Aaron's PhD student, is in review on a paper where he's showing that when the urchins are hungry, their essentially fear response is much more muted than, um, than when they're full, which is kind of bad news for barren recovery, right? Because yeah. they're mm -hmm. perhaps like not gonna care if a picno is around because they'll go for the kelp. But, you know, like at some level, it'll start to tip back if we can get enough picnos out there and get those urchins down, which is why I think some of the like combined management tool approaches are gonna be way more effective than just one or the other, right? Like if we can say go into a place and cull it first and then add the picnos, that'd be way more effective quickly. Um, and even if we can get like a patch of kelp forest working in an area that might like feed everybody enough that they won't be like psycho anymore. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's one thing. And then what else was I going to say? Um, I forgot. Anyway, yes, but they definitely have like a hunger, hunger kind of changes the equation. Yeah. Oh, that's super interesting. Yeah, no, thank you so much. See, very multifactorial. <laughs> thank you. I had another question. Mm. So have you guys done any work looking at like how their consumption rates change with size and like at what's, how big or how old does a pink gnome have to get till it can actually start effectively eating urchins? Right. Like. You know, I'm thinking about the, you know, the, sh the shift in that whole functional response can be really interesting in relation to yeah. how big they are. Yeah. So we did, we have done some stuff on that. Um, we, what I'm trying to remember from it is like, there's certainly a correlation between prey size and pycno size. So if you like give them a bunch of um, prey to eat of different sizes, the little ones won't eat the big things because they just can't handle it. But the big ones will still eat the little things. And They're then- Exactly like California sheephead. <laughs> yeah, they'll yeah, still that's eat a, little yeah. stuff. It's just yeah. that <laughs> yeah, sometimes at some point they like reach a, uh, like a handling capacity thing. Um, on the other hand, when you look at like, when you, when you say give them a smorgasbord of sizes and let them just eat whatever they want, the big ones actually don't eat any more than the little ones. Which so is they, they don't digest good. faster or anything. It's just yeah, okay. They'll no, just they eat don't eat slower. If anything, they eat faster. Mm -hmm. And I the think it's because do. they're just growing, so they have to eat quicker. Yeah. Um, and maybe they're eating smaller prey, so they need to eat more in order to like keep um, the same amount of calories. But um, anyway, I I there is some stuff to unpack there. And granted, like we weren't doing teeny tiny picnos, right? Like the ones that I'm. I did this experiment on where like 10 centimeters to 30 centimeters. Um, but I think that's fine because it, from what the growth rate stuff is showing, like they're reaching 10 centimeters in two years. Yeah, that's quick. That's amazingly quick. Which is quick. Do, you, do we know how big or old they have to get till they reproduce? Do we know anything about reproduction in, in those um, that, Oh yeah, I have a graph on that. Um, it's around... 25, 25 centimeters they're starting to reproduce. Okay. So around like age three. It they're, you know, it's tiny <laughs> at that point. Like there's definitely a huge like exponential increase in gonad weight with 
body weight. Um, so the big ones are making like many fold the number of gametes that the little ones are, but, um, but yeah, they're, they're reaching maturity at like three years or so. Spawning cool. once a year, multiple times a year. Trying to figure that out too. Um, I don't know if we'll ever know the number of spawns per year because it's really hard to catch them, but, um, it looks like they're spawning in the, um, May, June ish months. Well, that's a pretty long larval duration then before them hop, probably, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to figure out. Uh, well, Jason has them at at least 57 days in the lab. And then it goes up from there. So it's like a two to three and maybe even four month larval duration. Yeah, well, they can so they're spawning pretty, in June and they're pretty far, yeah. in like August to September is our thought. Good. We just need them to ride the current down this way. More and more. <laughs> yeah, totally. Gotta like, you know, hopefully the wind will the wind will push them down. <laughs> or we could just put some out there. <laughs> hey, fish and wildlife would let us. Yeah, yeah, that's the trick. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it would be that hard. I just need the yeah. permits. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 the trick right there. Yeah, yeah. Actually putting them out would be just would be easy. Yeah. I mean, not? I all well, I need they is have to come problem. from up north at some point anyways. That's the only way they're gonna get down here, right? So <laughs> like I'll solve this problem. Just give me a truck and a yeah. lot of ice. <laughs> and a permit yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh anyway i'm kidding i couldn't that wouldn't solve the problem and it's problematic but it isn't that hard to do great any other questions anyone oh we do have a question yes haley is that you go haley you can uh, unmute yourself can you or do i have to do can it you, can oh you there you go me? Yep. Awesome. Okay. I'm in a coffee shop. So I apologize if there's any like loud noises out of my control at the moment. So um, I was just really interested because <laughs> you talked about um, temperature being uh, just a major factor. So how do you think the El Nino event is the upcoming El Nino event is going to influence um, what you're studying? Just like, are there going to be any interferences or effects or? possible. I mean, warm water makes the disease more virulent. Um, so if we're going to see another outbreak, it would be during warm water events like El Nino. So I guess it's a possibility, but um, have we, I think we've had an El Nino since wasting, haven't we? Well, I guess it was during I mean, the, there was the 16, 2016, right? Which yeah, kind of that the was end the of the wave. It was all kind of combined, right? Yeah. Yeah, that yeah hasn't really been since then. it had kind of run its course by then. So I don't know if we can like definitely say that there's a relationship for it. And I know, do you know though that what we think is an old wasting event happened during the El Nino of like 97, 98 in the Channel Islands. So it seems like El Nino might, might do it, but um, I also am not totally convinced that, that was the same disease. Like there's only so many ways for a starfish to look sick and die. Um, and probably lots of different viruses cause the same symptoms. So um, who knows? <laughs> and that's all the virologist's job, not my job. <laughs> Another cool set of experiments would be looking at temperature effects on consumption, right? Because thinking as, as they go further south, if it's warmer, but not too warm, like does that also like, could they be more effective predators, right? And, you know. Yeah, a, I don't know. I. I know pisester eat more when it's warm. Yeah. But I don't know if at some um, point they're still limited by handling time, right? But right. yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I'm sure I wouldn't be surprised at all if they eat more when it's warm. And I do know from what we've seen, let's think. I'm trying to think if we have any information from like the lab in winter versus summer. I'm not sure that we do. That'd be good. That'd be a good first step though. Add it to your list. Add it to my list. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can't be in Alaska all the time. <laughs> cool. Well, is there any other questions, anybody? We do have one. Andrew, get on there. Hey, Andrew. Hey, nice to see you again. Sarah. Awesome talk. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, I've, I've got an echo going. Uh -oh. um, 
Yeah, I had a question. Do you know if the pig and pony are able to get everything they need nutritionally from these empty barren urchins? I think so. Oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> so very good question. There have been several people who've been like, oh, but if they're eating these empty urchins, aren't they just gonna like be sick? Um, but Jason Hoden has been feeding his baby pick nose uh, baby urchins and baby urchins don't have any gonads in them and he said they'll eat like 12 a day first of all which is nuts yeah and second of all that they grow faster on urchins than any other food source he gives them so as far as i mean assuming that their like physiology doesn't drastically change between being little and being big it, may, it might because of maturity, but um, they grow just fine on empty juvenile urchins. Um, I don't know if they make lots of eggs on empty juvenile urchins, but I can't imagine it would be, you know, it might be suppressed, but not like impossible to make eggs. Cool. Can I ask a follow up question? Of course. Hi, Bennett. Uh, when the urchins are eaten, like when an urchin goes in the hole, what comes out? A test. It's just like a clean test. Clean broken test. up. Yep. And no, they don't break it. So a gravid urchin, when that goes in the hole, what comes out? Is it, do they like, does the lantern come out and they're able to like get up in there and dissolve everything yeah. inside? Yeah, they, they spit out a totally empty, empty test. Okay. Um, with just like those little teeth left. So That's why. it doesn't seem like they, they break it either, which is kind of fun because that means what's going to be cool during these urchin uh, arena experiments is we're actually going to be able to measure field predation rates too, because mm -hmm. we can just look at the tests. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so Leave much. Leave behind very clean, beautiful abalone that you can put on necklaces too. <laughs> Uh-oh. Andrew, yeah. you got to learn that urchin cleaning uh, thing as a party trick that you can do. Yeah. Put the urchin yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spit out a clean test. That'd be oh, cool. Oh, you yep. want to know something crazy, though? That we discovered is tegula can handle being swallowed and for like days. What? And they get spit back out and they just crawl away. That's insane. Yeah. Amazing. It's, I mean, sometimes they'll, they'll die, but like, I'd say like 75% of the tegula that go in a pick now don't die. They come back out a few days later intact. You just got to have a good seal there and not a perculum, yep. I guess, huh? Not a perculum yeah. does its job. <laughs> and hold your breath for a really long time. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy too, because the pick eat them like popcorn. They'll like throw like seven of them in their mouths and like, and then they'll oh. spit them out and like six of them will walk away. <laughs> What? I know. <laughs> that is crazy. It's so crazy. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Well, at this point, unless anyone else has a question, I think we'll let you go. And uh, but Sarah will be down here for the Western Society of Naturalists meeting in a month. So there'll be yep. lots of other opportunities to meet with her and chat with her uh, if you didn't have a chance to ask questions now or something pops up uh, you know, as soon as you go home. Yeah. All, All right. right. Thanks. Thanks, thanks so much for such a fun seminar. It was awesome. See ya. Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing you in a little bit. Totally. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye.